Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thanks for coming tonight. Um, I would like to start by thanking the the Escape Society um, and especially some of the its most active members because they are constantly trying to make these these initiatives, bringing together uh, students with other people, uh, academics, practitioners, whatever. Um, and well, this time, this was slight, the arrangement was slightly different because usually the Escape Society approaches me to, to, to do something, whereas this time I actually asked them if they were interested, or if they thought that the students were interested in, in me um, having this talk tonight because it articulates with the exhibition that is now um, downstairs in the tent gallery. Some of you might have seen it already. Um, and I know that this is a very busy time uh, of the year, especially for the final years, and I see some of them here. Um, it's also very busy uh, for us academics, um, but I think that it's a good uh, moment to, because most of you are already on holidays or almost going, uh, so it would, it would be good to just have this last moment together before you go for this very, very long summer that we have. Um, so I am... Um, both excited and a bit nervous uh, with this presentation today. Um, well, I was a bit more nervous yesterday because I had kind of a rehearsal yesterday with um, a more difficult crowd, I would say. Um, so I'm excited because I have the chance of talking, even if briefly, about some of the topics that really interest me and that I've, I've been investigating over the, over the last almost two years. And these are, of course, themes that excite me and around which I'm orbiting uh, also with my PhD. Um, and I, I'm nervous, especially because some of these topics are, of course, very complex. And I'm still in the process of, it's a very exciting process of finding um, meaningful things about them and navigating through them. So one thing um, I would like to mention straight away is that this talk, that does not aim to exhaust everything that is to be said about these topics, but rather, and on the contrary, its main aim is to actually and hopefully open interesting questions. So, I've just returned from Colombia. Uh, uh, yesterday I had uh, important people from Colombia, and it's important not to mix the two things because it happens quite often. Uh, but I came from Colombia where I spent two weeks as part of a research team from Esalvi and Herrick. Well, actually, Catherine is here, and she was the, the first one um, in landscape to be involved in this project. And then because of her, I uh, got to be part of this very exciting project. And our research there is not necessarily linked to what I'm telling you today, but something happened while I was there last time uh, that might be a good start for our conversation today. So it was the second time I visited the city of Medellin. The city of Medellin is the second city in Colombia. It's not um, as big as Bogotá, but still very important. And the first time I visited was in August last year, so it was not a long time ago. Um, and when I arrived, now in April, I noticed that there was something strange in the weather, though I could not um, exactly explain what it was. It was something that I was feeling. So the city of the eternal spring, as they call it, um, was much foggier than it used to be and during the day and a, a bit colder during the night because the temperature in Medellin is quite constant throughout the year and throughout the day. So the city spread sorry, the city spreads itself along um, along a, a very long valley uh, which is surrounded by the northern tip of the Andes. So the Andes here come to die as they say and it, it divides in, into three ranges and Medellin is surrounded by two of these of these ranges. Um, but the fog this time did not allow us to see these quite prominent mountain ranges, which was a bit weird. Uh, two of my colleagues had arrived before me a week earlier, to be more precise, and in the meantime, one had developed a very weird cough, and the other one had um, skin allergy, had developed a very serious skin allergy. And then there was a third one with the same kind of allergy. Of course, we don't know if these things are, um, are related in any way, but of course, uh, the news were becoming more and more evident. I don't know if you saw, but the BBC was covering this uh, in Colombia. Uh, 
Um, and so what, what happened was that there was a cloud of pollution um, which had formed very quickly due to a very dramatic increase in traffic and also from local industries and the cloud was capping the valley and in the absence of wind uh, it stayed there for, for two weeks. Now, of course, this is not the first time we have had a, um, a what we call smog or a cloud of pollution hanging above our cities. Um, yet Medellin is not a mega city like Beijing or London or Mexico City, where this, this phenomenon uh, occurs more, more frequently. In fact, Medellin is what we call a, 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 a medium-sized city. It's less than 4 million uh, inhabitants. Plus, Medellin is also known as one of the most innovative cities in the world, or so they say, which is part of our project, is what we're trying to assess. And the truth is that I had heard of these clouds before, but this was the first time I actually encountered one of these. And it was something so big and so in and around us that we couldn't actually see it. Yet our respiratory, respiratory systems and the skins our skin was, was were very quick to react and to give us these small, yet to me quite alarming signs that something, that this big thing was doing something to us. And it's also, of course, uh, politically they're quite active and uh, these, this, these sculptures are by a very famous sculptor called Botero, which is Colombian from Medellin, and um, the, main, the main square has loads of these statues and they created these masks to, to of course, highlight the fact that this is also a political decision. And it's also curious to note, as a side note, I would say, that the city also reacted very quickly, because they were alarmed with this, by rationalizing the traffic coming into town and, and making the public transport free for a whole week, and um, that the subway and the tram systems were never so busy. Okay, so from, from this story, it has probably come across to you that I'm interested in the massive global changes that um, happened across the globe. But the truth is that I'm also um, interested in the smaller, perhaps even intangible um, changes happening on a very localized scale and how they may eventually acquire some sort of expression when repeated uh, over several days or months or years or even decades or centuries. Um, so the provisional title of my PhD, as it stands now, is Landscape Ontologies of Time in the Anthropocene. And this is perhaps too fancy a title, I would say, uh, hence my emphasis on it being still provisional. But it basically can be broken down into um, three components. Landscape, Ontologies of Time, and of course, Anthropocene. And, and I feel I have to explain myself a bit more by what I mean about these three things, so it's a question of terminology, as I very often say, before I move on to, to explain you something more specifically about the work. So first, my interest in change is actually related to two things. One is time, and the other one is scale. From the point of view of landscape architecture, the, the concentration of time um, and scale become important when sustaining the idea that landscape um, as a dynamic and choreographed construction of systems and science in the territory is created and shared collectively by all living communities and also by non-living matter in successional layers that are organized in space but also in time. So understanding it implies an inclusive comprehension of change and its temporal and spatial implications since landscape is never complete but rather a, working, a, a continuous work in progress. So if landscape mediates between delicate balances of built and unbuilt, of growth and decay, of productivity and fallow that compete against and complete each other um, in a quest for successional points of equilibrium. So the evolving nature of this concept accepts the idea that landscape is a representation of processes in action in a territory that can be described by using both objective and subjective methodologies. In the discipline of landscape architecture, distinct concentrations of time and scale have been inherited from a disciplinary synthesis of knowledge coming from the physical, the natural and the social sciences, and of course from the humanities as well. So time has indeed become an important part of landscape architectural theory and practice, that's why, for instance, we teach that so much. 
allowing us to deal more efficiently with things like complexity or uncertainty or duration or resilience. But the challenge in defining and understanding and even designing time has also aggravated ambiguity and, in my opinion, has brought some sort of lack of clarity sometimes to our discipline. So, in my work, the work that, part of the work that I'm going to explain today, the question of what is time or what does it become through the lens of the landscape is constantly challenged by an equally um, meaningful um, interrogation of what is the potential of the landscape to become an immersive and experimental field to ontologically define time. Um, the increasingly expanding spatial and temporal scales of human action on Earth have compelled our discipline, landscape architecture, to deal with wider spectra of knowledge in an attempt to formulate robust methodologies and instruments to design time in order to activate and empower the landscape in what we may now call the Anthropocene. So, for those who don't know, the Anthropocene is an informal way of referring to the contemporary geological epoch, the one we live now, in which humans, uh, or human beings, have become the dominant geologic force altering the planet. Just to give you a few examples, we now move more than twice the earth and soil than all of the oceans and seas and lakes and rivers combined together. Okay, this is just to give you an example. Another example would be the fact that today, on a global scale, we consume every day 400 years of biomass with our fossil fuels. Um, so things like this, uh, which is the Pacific trash vortex, a huge island of rubbish in the Pacific, or the nuclear disaster in Fukushima in Japan, I'm sure you've heard of it, or the Three Gorges Dam in China, which is the biggest dam in the world and has changed slightly the rotation of the axis of the earth because of the power of the water moving. Or even the first environmental refugees are no longer science fiction, unfortunately, but rather dystopian realities that were caused by human-induced change. So it is important at this point to mention as well that in my study of the ontologies of time, landscape is used as this methodological lens. So it's used as a method or a tool or a narrative or a device while the Anthropocene, as I was explaining, is used less as a scientific nomenclature to designate this contemporary epoch and more as a philosophical and contextual, socio-cultural and also environmental framework. And this distinction is very important. It might sound as subtle, but it's actually very important because uh, it hopefully distances what I'm doing, my work, from the controversy among some scientific circles. So just to give you a bit of more context, uh, there is an international society of geologists and stratigraphers, and they will decide later this year whether or not we should actually call the contemporary geological epoch as the Anthropocene. But in my opinion, the cat is out of the bag, as they say, because we there's there's loads of academics, loads of researchers, loads of practitioners interested in the topic whether or not we decide to call it the Anthropocene. So, on the contrary, what I'm doing is using the Anthropocene as a powerful and meaningful metaphor that allows me to contextualize my investigation in this growing awareness that there is on, on, of, the, of the current crisis of the Earth systems by opening up questions, mainly, while also attempting to encourage distinct social, cultural and ecologic or ecological strategic encounters with change. So now focusing more on the design work I've been conducting uh, within the scope of my PhD. My PhD, um, as some of you know, is, is, a, is a specific kind of PhD, is a PhD by design, um, which means that, um, of course, there's a, there's a theoretical and a philosophical implication of the work, uh, on the work I'm doing, but it's also developed uh, through design, or the development of design. And um, as you've noticed already with the title of this talk, and some of you already know part of my work, I have been testing some of these ideas in Manhattan, in the city of New York. So this work started with my participation in an international competition in 2014 um, that was hosted by the city of New York. Uh, 
um, and evolved since then into a series of methods that propose a recontextualization of the city in deep time, or geological time, uh, that is in the much wider spatial and temporal scales of the geologic. By the way, I'm saying geologic all the time and not geological, okay, they are two different things. The word geologic no longer or is no longer used to conjure meanings that simply refer to geology. Today, philosophers, thinkers, artists, um, designers um, use the, the, the idea of geologic to also to understand the cultural and aesthetical shifts we are provoking with these massive changes. So the notion to me is very important because it allows us to think, allows us all to think experimentally about things like scale, space or time. So, uh, I'm going to start with this image because this image was quite seminal or is fundamental in all the work that I've been developing since 2014. And the story of this, of this image is that in 1999, New York-based experimental ar architect, sorry, uh, Mabuse Woods, um, presented the island of Manhattan in a very unusual form. Uh, Lower Manhattan, as it's called, is an aerial view of the island with the East and the Hudson Rivers both dammed, and it was a revelation of what we sh all should already know but tend to forget, that New York, uh, or the, the, the city's buildings and parks and infrastructure um, actually sit on a huge metamorphic rock. And as the architect once said, and I'm quoting, Manhattan sits on the earth. Okay. So, with its image of the reconciliation of New York's most iconic symbol, the skyscraper, with its rocky foundation, Lower Manhattan resonates with another very important image, uh, but basically it resonates with James Hutton's notion of deep time, which was formulated uh, during the Scottish Enlightenment, with, 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 which was a very exciting period here in Scotland. Um, and this was an idea that um, gave new ways of reading and representing a planet that was in fact much older than accepted by religious dogma. So while investigating the compositional layers of Manhattan's geologic, Woods was interested in the scale or the scales of the city and its buildings and how small they are when compared to the Earth itself. So it is a question of spatial and also temporal scales which compress, distort, and thicken the island in successional layers. And over the last 200 years, uh, as you all know, Manhattan has uh, experienced a formidable urban expansion. The uh, very ambitious plan to overlay uh, a rigid grid on the once forested and wet and hilly island went through many variations most of which, I would say, were ruthlessly determined to flatten hills, to cut rocks, to mill forests, to fill ponds, wetlands and marshes, thus erasing the marks of what they considered to be an unregulated past. Manhattan, as we know today, uh, represents an extremely dense urban fabric where neoliberalist capitalism, this is quite complex, but uh, where neoliberalist capitalism was crystallized in these tall, iconic skyscrapers, but also in the massive above and underground infrastructure and the very high speculative real estate and retail markets. So there is a lot of uh, very famous iconography that I'm sure all of you have encountered somewhere about the city, which proves our fascination as well as ways through which the city itself constantly rebrands so this body of work that I'm going to very briefly talk to you today uh, is divided in three parts and the exhibition follows the same structure. The first is an exercise of revealing Manhattan's geologic delineations um, and of speculating on issues of representation when the island is all of a sudden positioned in a much wider space-time depth. The second part of this work aims to rethink architectural and engineering uh, inventions in the city as devices for working with geological forms. And the third one, which is not finished yet, it's just a work in progress, proposes the notion of park uh, as a politically charged landscape veil. Okay? So, going on to the first one. 
uh, and going back to the image that I've shown you. One of the most intriguing qualities of the Bill's Woods Lower Manhattan, in my opinion, is its power to evoke a subliminal depiction of New York. The image invites the beholder to look into an unfathomable abyss and awes with a sudden desire to see what one cannot in fact see. With Lower Manhattan, Woods proposed a reconciliation of New York with the bedrock on which the city has laid its foundations, thus exploring this idea of scale in the relationship between the city and the planet itself. Woods was less interested in the accuracy of the geologic representation that in providing a geologic context for it within deep space and deep time, while also emphasizing that such an intrepid action must always exist between precision and contingency, because it has to do with the limits of our own knowledge. So Lower Manhattan is a representation of New York that at the same time gestures towards what lies beyond the limits of representation and of representability, and of the aesthetics of the sublime in the tradition of pictorial representations in landscape painting and also early photography. So geology and photography uh, were prominent examples of such practices, especially when we were having this very exciting moment in the, in, in the 19th century. And there, there are many examples of work focused around the exploration of representational boundaries of the world around us. Now, Imagine this deep section cutting across the island from the tip of the, the tallest skyscraper, descending all the way through the building's entrance at street level, and through the underground foundations until it hits the rock. Imagine that the deep section cuts even further, passing through the folded and deformed layers of schist, marble, and gneiss that actually support the island. In the words of Labille's woods, uh, in his 2012 epilogue to Lower Manhattan, which is a different project, and I'm quoting, once we begin to consider what lies below Manhattan, it is very hard to know where to stop. Now, even without offering an accurate delineation of the rock, the deep section encourages to consider a recalibration of the city. By puncturing through these, this unfathomable abyss, it reveals Manhattan's geological scales whilst raising a cognitive challenge with its limits and also with our own limitations as humans. It attunes us with changes spreading across the incommensurable scales of deep time and deep space that dissolve the city as a moment of significant disruption in that landscape, and at the same time they amplify geology as the stage of enduring processes of sedimentation and erosion. So my Indiva was to translate the deep section into a model that would test new relations among scales. And with, these, with, with this um, three-dimensional tool, I aimed to illustrate the fossilized accumulations of city, of soil, and of rock that put into evidence New York City as a geologic force. And at the same time, I also attempted to translate the incommensurable geologic change of Manhattan taking place across deep space and deep time into our own amenable temporal and spatial scales, that is, the scales that we can eventually relate to. So, two potentially relevant questions at this point. Uh, the first one has to do with the meaning and the implications of creating such a device, and the second one has to do with its potential implications for new representations of the island. So in this 2012 epilogue to Lower Manhattan, LaBille's Woods shares a few of his preoccupations, and this project was done just before he died, uh, and he shares a few of his preoccupations with the meaning of contextualizing Manhattan as geologic. Although recognizing that the movement of the tectonic plate beneath the city could take millions of years before becoming humanly detectable, the architect explains that the mere awareness of a um, of a methodology of a sorry of a um, of a of a moving rock, which also implies the notion of a moving city, uh, could be enough to change our way of understanding and therefore inhabiting the planet, and could certainly change our position and our plans for. So within the, the, the 13 years that separate Lower Manhattan from its epilogue, Woods 
architectural discourse when describing New York City evolved to define the tectonic movements of a whole planet. And in this new concept, cities become uh, rafts adrift in an underground sea of semi-liquid rock, and they move. They move slowly, but they move surely. So there is today um, an increasingly awareness of the need to aesthetically represent what emanates from the geologic. And I think that where the Bills Woods succeeded in pushing its representation by expanding the city as fossilized impressions in space and time, what we now need to do is to represent the human as a geologic force by accumulating those impressions in meaningful ways. So, these projects um, are not organized in any particular order in terms, in theoretical terms, but rather the way I, I happen to develop them. So, they are more or less chronological. So, the second project um, is called Foregrounding the Geologic, and I was trying to understand how could I um, use the city or parts of the city as devices for working uh, in, in, in these faults that exist in Manhattan. So the iconographic power of thick representations such as the view map of, um, produced in 1865, which shows the original territorial and also landscape conditions of the island superimposed over this rigid grid, comes from their evocation of a subliminal image of the city. They are representations of the island that gesture towards what exceeds them, as well as being powerful and engaging devices that allow us to read what usually escapes our comprehension and attention in more conventional depictions. So the view map uh, remains today as a fundamental, although it was produced in the 19th century, it remains today as a fundamental document for many structural engineers that work in the city, facing the challenges of laying foundations across the island precisely because of the information it reveals about the inaccessible layers of the city. So in my quest to foreground Manhattan's uh, geologic conditions, I found uh, in the trestle bridges that span over 125th Street uh, in Manhattan, just above Central Park, uh, a very important, and, and where there is a very important geological fault line, fertile ground to explore how architectural and also geoengineering inventions may challenge our usual ways of reading this island. These bridges um, make preoccupation with geological dynamics visible, in my opinion, where they carry an elevated section of the Broadway Interborough Rapid Transit subway system, for example, there are large hinges on the abutments. So that, and now I'm quoting, if vertical movement were to take place along the fault, and by vertical movement along the fault, I mean an earthquake, uh, the bridge would move on its hinges, but hopefully remain intact, and the transportation system would be undisturbed. So we, this quote is very loaded, and it was, uh, it was written by a very famous geologist whose work is, was devoted to the city of New York. And basically, it shows the preoccupation of the city they know that there are these faults, and although they are stable, they can move. Uh, and of course, if they move, usually it means panic. But what they want to do with these architectural and engineering inventions is to hopefully make sure that the communication um, is not interrupted with these, with these movements. So the creation of a representational device able to reveal the role of the bridges within a thicker exploration of the island as a whole implied a creative leap beyond the usual representational limits of the city. So the device soon became an architectural invention in itself, whose main potential was to convey unexpected scales of space and time. Optimal distance and focal length, uh, for example, were transformed into operative tools to generate multiple readings of architecture. And manipulation and abstraction were then fine-tuned through successive acts of drawing and modeling in order to allow elements of the geological, the geological layers to interfere with the man-made layers that compose the city. And the geologic, in turn, was contaminated with interferences coming from other spatial and temporal scales, such as the original conditions of the island, or the movement of the geological apparatus across deep time. 
It is as though the lens of a microscope was um, deliberately used to blur the city surfaces that are usually at the center of our focus, and the samples being observed have been deliberately contaminated with unexpected um, dimensions of change. So what are the consequences? Sorry, what are the consequences of this creative process has been to encourage the condition or the conditions of some of Manhattan's faults to emerge from the background. So foregrounding the geologic representation, in my opinion, highlights an interesting uh, scalefulness uh, that verges on the scaleless. So the scaleless means, well, but let me go back. So scale is something that is always measured against something else. And that's why it's so different from size. Now, scaleless in this context does not mean a lack of scale, but rather the lack of a possibility of scale. And the reason why this happens, uh, very briefly, this is a very complex subject, but the reason why this happens is because usually we tend to scale the world around us according to our own bodies. Um, but with the Anthropocene, we are going beyond some of these um, scales that relate to our, to our human body, and we are now acknowledging its limitations. So when we go beyond this, we stop being able to use our own body to scale all these things. That's why we lose the possibility of scale. Um, so this um, impossibility of scale is not unusual in the discipline of geology, for example, which moves very diligently, in my opinion, across exponential scales of time and space in search of behavioral patterns or structure or even material responses to environmental conditions. So the strangeness of macroscopic depictions of whole territorial conditions side by side with microscopic images of truncated mineral composition leaves us with this uncanny sense um, not of mastering, as I was saying, but instead of losing control of scale. Now, for the third and last project, um, as, as I said, it's not finished yet. I have to decided, sorry, I have decided to investigate a little, a little bit more about the role that parks perform in Manhattan. <coughs> of course, parks do not all have the same cultural or social or even ecological functions in the city. We all know that. So, what I've decided to do instead, or as a starting point, was to focus on a perhaps less known uh, part of the island. So a visit to Inwood Hill Park, I don't know if, you know if you've ever been there, on the northern tip of the island, is to me as refreshing as it, as, as it is surprising. Uh, so the big rock that composes this park is poised where the East River meets, meets the Hudson, so on the top of the island, and is covered with a very dense deciduous forest linked with a salt marsh through a very thick and very dark valley. It's a very dramatic landscape, um, offering views to the, to the Palisades uh, on the other side, uh, on, on the, the side of New Jersey, uh, and to other hills in the vicinity as well. And to me, is a time gate to the old Lenny Lenape's Manahatta. So Manahatta means, in their, in their native language, the land of many hills. And this rocky hill was forged uh, by glacial retreat of the Winscanson ice sheet that once covered um, a big part of the North American plate, and is today considered um, by, by everyone uh, that knows Inwood Hill Park, a natural ha uh, haven by visitors and, and locals alike, I would say. Now, the thing is that this vision which describes Inwood as the last piece of native forest and salt marsh on the island, is not only simplistic, but also inaccurate. I would argue that there is another way of understanding this landscape that, although perhaps being less romantic, it is certainly uh, more articulated with its temporal evolution and its previous uses, some of which are rather obscure and were brutally erased from this, from this piece of landscape. Now, from being used for timber during the war campaigns between the British and the colonies, the wars of independence, 
to a weekend retreat for rich, for rich merchants that were coming from downtown, and even to a place of many asylums, um, Inwood underwent significant landscape changes, most of which were determined by the growth of the city that was advancing very fast from south to north. Following the archaeological campaigns in the area in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which uncovered several caves that had once served as dwellings for the native tribes, the city considered the possibility of creating a park. The influential city planner called Robert Moses, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but it's an inevitable figure in Manhattan, used his position as park commissioner in the 1930s to initiate a ruthless process of demolition of all the mansions that still existed on the hill, as well as the asylums that occupy the ridges, such as the House of Mercy, the House of Rest for Consumptives, or the Asylum for the New York Magdalene Benevolent Society. They have very complex names, but basically they were asylums where um, they, it, it were, they were mainly uh, created to put young women, which is a dreadful thing. Uh, so back then, um, so I'm talking about the, throughout the 19th century, but also in the early 20th century, before the First World War, uh, if uh, people saw a young lady uh, dancing in a bar, for example, and they didn't like it, they could complain to their, to, to their um, parents or to their uh, older brothers, and they, could, they had the power to put these girls in these asylums, where they would stay forever. Uh, so it's quite, to me, quite a, an, an, an upsetting um, reality that was completely erased from this landscape. So Moses' decision to erase all the marks of this convoluted past and to create the park were closely aligned with the new planning policy to create public outdoor spaces throughout the city. As the city grid spread a new orthogonal rule in Manhattan, several parks in diff of different sizes and in different locations, especially north of Central Park, were defined in areas where the rock was either too big or too hard to cut. So my effort to um, understand the contemporary meaning of Inwood Hill Park encouraged a deeper research into some of the political processes behind uh, the creation of some of these parks that still exist today in Manhattan. The boundaries that define these soft landscapes in the grid demonstrate that there are in fact singularities in, the, in this very rigid urban form. Some parks are limited by significant streets or avenues, alien to the grid itself, which divide the island in different administrative areas or neighborhoods. And uh, the park systems, of which Inwood is definitely a paradigmatic case, operate as thick skins that mediate the relationships of scale between the bedrock, the city, the last provision of fertile soil on the island, and of course, uh, the layers of vegetation. It is also important, in my opinion, to know that some of these systems were defined in, in close articulation with Manhattan's geological faults. So Inwood Hill Park, in fact, is part of one of these complex systems which were not only delineated by these faults, but they inclusively hinge on them. So the unique geomorphological conditions acquire significant importance in this context for three main reasons. First, uh, the comprehension of these parts as organized systems allows their conceptualization as geological constellations, where each of these parts is subordinated to, to the geometric rules of the fault. <coughs> Second, one may also think of these parts as spatial and temporal heterotopias, that is, realities that are not connected with the bigger reality of the island. An idea which may have philosophical and also political implications and gives the park a dual condition. On the one hand, it gives the parks the condition of otherness precisely because they are heterotopic islands, so they are something else. And on the other hand, they give uh, the parks a condition of togetherness because they are, as I said, contextualized, necessarily contextualized 
in the much wider space-time choreographies of, of this landscape. And the third reason has to do with the fact that the parks mediate between the rock below, the city around, and the atmosphere above. And here, the notion of the park as a landscape veil, which is the, the title of this part of the project, deserves special attention, for it opens up questions of thickness and thinness, of concealing and revealing, of permeability and support, or even of resilience and adaptation. Associations with art pieces, such as the Veiled Lady, um, with all the variations that exist. I don't know if, you ever, if you've ever seen one of these statues, but they're remarkable. They're made just of stone, although it looks like a veil. Uh, and there's, there's loads of variations of this veiled lady. Um, may come to mind when I talk about landscape veil. And it is important to note that the idea of parks as landscape veils, which I'm proposing now, uh, is not merely aesthetic or ecological, but also political, cultural, and of course, urban as well. So for this third exercise, I developed this, this model or this device in which a thick drawing uh, supports a layered model uh, weighting or, or balancing the physical solidity of the hill because it's pure rock marble directly against its ecological fluidity. Uh, and I did this to test material responses of the forest and the salt marsh to environmental conditions, because these systems are in constant evolution, they are constantly changing. So the set of design tools emerged from the successional testing and comparative analysis between these material responses and the materials and techniques used to compose the model itself. Together, model and drawing weight, solidity and fluidity uh, through a series of articulated design principles related to things like draping or stitching or saturating or crystallizing, which are kind of weird um, actions if we think about the normal landscape architectural practice. But if these drawings are downstairs, so if you want to have a, a closer look, then I break them down into um, or bring them closer to our own vocabulary. So the new terminology here proposed uh, also relates to the necessary temporal dimensions through which inward constantly reinvents itself. Things like deep time, as I mentioned, but also seasonality, non-linear historical evolution, or temporal heterotopia. And without trying to exhaust such an extensive discussion, of course, uh, I don't have the time or the knowledge to exhaust it here, I would like to argue that, as in most cases, each of these dimensions corresponds, in fact, to different ontologies of time. That is, uh, each of them corresponds to distinct constructions of time that, in fact, broadly correspond also to, the, to these distinct visions of the world. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you have any questions um, or if you would like to ask me something which you haven't understood or something that you would like a bit more explanation. Um, if, if not, what we can do, I don't know how you, how you organize this, but what we can do is go down and then you can also talk through some of the things in the exhibition. Okay? I was, yes. I was going to ask, you, you split it up into three parts, yes. and was that um, a decision you made when you started the research in the beginning, or did that just evolve naturally that you decided to then break it up? It evolved naturally. In the beginning, I had no, well, I shouldn't say this, but in the beginning, I had no clue of what I was doing, and I just go along, I tried to go along, and because uh, within the scope of this PhD, um, you set your own brief, pretty much like the way you're doing now before you graduate, and as you know, because now you have been through this, um, you define a brief, but then the process of research by design sometimes points to directions that you you didn't expect, and some of the things that you were trying to foreground actually are not that important, so they go immediately to the background of your project. And this happened um, quite brutally in this process, because the, I started with the, with the competition, and the competition was to redesign uh, 42nd Street, so it was something very specific. The brief was very tight and it was very specific. 
And although I, I tried immediately to challenge that brief through the competition, then I opened up the scale to the whole island. And when that happened, there's all sorts of implications in terms of time, space, and scale that I was not expecting. So from there, I evolved into the first project that had to do with the recalibration of the city. And from that, then I discovered that there were these um, architectural inventions that were trying to cope with the faults. And then from that point on, I, I had always been interested in um, the history of the parks in New York because it's a fascinating history. Uh, and people just assume that the parks were always there and the parks will always be there, uh, where in fact um, most of them were um, very specific political decisions, even Central Park was a political decision. Um, and I, 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 I'm just fascinated by the story behind the creation of these parks. And then I realized that the parks, actually the way they were designed, is that they, they are not isolated, they are, they are part of systems. And that's what motivated my third this third iteration. And I'm not entirely sure if this is over or if I'm going to find something else next month or in a couple of months. Yeah. That was going to be my question. It seems like the process is quite organic. So do you see where you're heading? Like, where do you want to end up? Or what drives you in the future? Because I presume your PhD is a certain length. Yes. So what decides when it ends? So um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I think ultimately what, decide, what decides when it ends is the when you when you're approaching the end of the PG and you have to write up, that's when you stop. <laughs> Usually, that's when you stop. Hopefully, um, I don't know um, what is what's going to be the next steps. I have some ideas. Uh, I, I can tell you what my supervisors would like me to do, which is to make an intervention in the city of New York. So to take all this work and then prepare it as an intervention um, and offer it to the city. And I'm thinking about maybe collaborating with artists that are based there and uh, whose interests some, somewhat are similar to my own interests. Um, but I, I, I don't know yet. <laughs> yes? Um, just a question for, to the start. So was the competition first or did you start right, like, you know, thinking about your PhD and then the competition just came in or how did you... Yeah, that's the, the second one. So I was already in the process of applying to the PhD. And in the meantime, uh, because I, as you know, I tend to be a bit chaotic with my, the way I manage my time. So I was preparing that, I was doing all the stuff that we need to do here, and I was also taking part in this competition. And the reason why I did it was because I, from the brief and the way I read the brief, I realized that I could immediately challenge it by making a statement about my own interest which was to reconnect the city with its rocky foundation. And because, um, because I, a, a few months later I found out that I had won this competition, and that was precisely the beginning of the PhD, um, my, Professor Mark Dorian, who supervises my work, thought that that could be an, an, an entry point into the PhD, so I could immediately have a, a, a gate into the PhD, and that's what motivated um, all this work basically since 2014. Yeah. Yes. Um, you make it seem as if everything's gone like so perfectly and stuff. I wonder. Which what, is not the case. Yeah. What <laughs> some of the biggest all. problems have been like. Um, really I can problems. tell you. I can tell you a uh, lot of problems. The <laughs> first problem has to do with the fact that, as Kathleen, for instance, knows, but some of you know as well, um, we are full time members of staff, that means that I'm here with you all the time. Even if I'm not in the studio, I am in the in nearby and I'm, I'm working as a member of staff. So that means that I have to go home every day at 6, 7 p.m. and start working on my patients. So you can imagine that is a big problem. Time management is a big problem with these sort of part-time PhDs. But more related to the work itself, I think that um, one of the problems is because I do these devices or these models basically to, to test new possibilities of drawing, which is ultimately what I'm interested in. Uh, the way I conceive these models, it happens to all of us. You have um, something in your mind uh, which is perfect. And then there's all sorts of limitations. The first one is that you don't have the knowledge to do the models or you don't have the skills to do the models. And then when you start, you have all these pieces and you want to put them together, 
you put them together but they don't work in the way you wanted it to work so it doesn't respond in the way you were expecting it to respond so just to give you an example uh, before I started this PhD I had no clue in terms of technology how we could 3D print, laser cut, uh, CNC, make CNC sculptures and all these kind of things. And through the PhD, I have been learning all these processes. And that's basically why I encourage you all so much to also produce these things, because there's no other way in these processes other than learning through making. So that was one big limitation that I had and that I had to overcome. So it's not linear at all and it's quite chaotic I have to say. Yes? So you say um, you did this competition and mm -hmm. it was to design, was it to, was the brief to design the street? Yeah, the, the, do you know 42nd Street in New York is the one that passes in front of Grand Central Station and the Chrysler building so okay. it's one that connects both rivers, it's one of these horizontal ones uh, and it's a very significant one uh, and uh, basically the the transit uh, or the traffic authority, they are testing different possibilities all the time. And one of the possibilities the city is now investigating is what would happen if they removed all of a sudden the cars from some of these avenues, which, is, which refutes completely the, the American model of building these cities. So it's close to our European way of conceiving the cities. Uh, and of course, they would like that to happen, and to a certain extent they tested that uh, on Times Square, uh, but they are really, really afraid of what will the reaction be. So what they do is that they sometimes they have these competitions to test public opinion through the ideas of the designers. So they host the competition, they ask the designers to respond to a brief, which is quite vague, in this case was to remove the cars and replace the cars with a light tram solution that would connect both rivers. And then if public opinion responds really badly to the to the results, they say, well, hey, this is not our fault, this is what the designers proposed. <laughs> but this is a very common system, don't this is not naive, this there, there is a political agenda behind it. Um, and they are constantly doing this. They did the same for Battery Park. So Battery Park, as you know, is the park that exists uh, at the, the, south, the southern tip of Manhattan, right at the edge, um, it is a landfill, and the, the landfill was created as they were extracting the, the soil to build the Twin Towers, the old Twin Towers, not these new ones. So they were removing the soil and putting right next to it, and then all of a sudden they had this massive landfill and they didn't know what to do, uh, and they wanted to build it. But then there was this very influential artist, I don't know if you know the name, I, I, Agnes Dennis, and she, um, she planted a, a wheat uh, field to highlight the fact that that was a very valuable resource and they could build a public park, and then they had a competition and then that's how things work, and they tested all these things. They are constantly testing these things. The same happened with the high line, the same is happening now with the low line, the same is happening with, with Harlem, Harlem is going through a very intense renovation process, so these things are constantly happening, and in cities like New York, it's quite uh, important that they test these things before they implement it. Yeah. Yeah. So have they, have they done an exhibition? Or they did a public exhibition, um, um, and, well, I, I can go, uh, so I, I had to send my work, but I can go, and they told me that public opinion, as always, was a bit divided, so what they are now thinking is they will test a bit more and then maybe if they decide to implement part of it, they will ask those of us, because there were four winners in the end, those of us who won, they will probably ask us to, to, some sort, to give some sort of contribution to that work, I suppose. Yes? I'm not sure if it's a question, but I it might be just a call. Yeah, I would like to hear more about um, like uh, parts as parts of systems mm -hmm. in the city, and also the process of uh, using fabric and the veil as a way you know, to explore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how does it work? So those are two two different questions. The first one, the parts as, as systems. Basically, what happens in New York is that New York has this very big rock beneath it, 
and the rock, of course, because it's very old, has many faults. So the faults in the old Manhattan, when there was no city, the faults would correspond usually to valleys, of course, and to uh, streams or wetlands. Yeah, and that was the way the Leni Lenape, the, the, the native tribe, would navigate through the island was by moving along these, these um, valleys. Uh, and then the city came, and with the, the, the plan of the grid, the orthogonal grid, they wanted to make Manhattan as flat as possible because it was a, a plan, an idea they had. Um, there were two problems. The one is that Manhattan was actually very rocky, and some of these rocks were extremely hard or too big to cut. And so they would spend so much money to cut them, or, or flattening them, that they decided to leave them for a while, while they were thinking. And the city grew around them. And then because there was this momentum uh, with Robert Moses, um, which, which Robert Moses did not invent this political agenda of creating parks. He just went along with what was happening. It was happening the same in Paris, it was happening the same in London, it was happening the same in Rome. So people realized, or the politicians realized, that parks were something good. And, and that's good because they realized it. Because otherwise, probably Manhattan wouldn't have any parks. <clears throat> and, um, they had already built a huge portion of that grid. So they decided, well, why don't we use these opportunities where we can't cut the rock to put the parks, yeah? So that's one part of the argument. The other one, the reason why they work as systems is because most of the times these faults happen where there's two very hard rocks contact or making direct contact with each other. And because they are so hard, they can't cut this part and they can't cut that part as well. Um, and so that's, that's how parts become part of the system, because they're actually part of the system that was determined by the fault. So in fact, I don't know if you can see from this image, probably you can't. Uh, this is a fault, one of the most important faults in Manhattan, that uh, organizes this part as part of the system that composes Fort Washington and also Harlem River Park on this side. You can see in the model downstairs. And they are all organized according to this fault. One, this is a marble hill and this is schist. So two very hard rocks um, contacting with one another and they couldn't cut them so they left them alone. Yeah? So basically part of this argument is leave these things alone because they will generate something good. That was the argument, and that's what eventually created the parks. Now, with regards to the veil, to the draping, uh, that was a very uh, interesting thing. Um, it's a very personal story, but I can, I can share with you. Uh, my sister, although she's an architect as well, her passion is fashion. And she is about, she, the baby, she's pregnant and the baby's due today or tomorrow. And as she was developing in terms of pregnancy, women develop a lot during those nine months, and she became really interested in in, in developing these these toys with draping. And I visited her, um, I don't know, uh, six or seven months ago, and I saw these fascinating things with the very delicate draping. And at the same time, I was I was wondering how could I represent this this fluidity of the Martian, because the marsh is something spongy but it's something that evolves quite brutally and very quickly. And that was basically me saying, okay, maybe I could, it's very organic, maybe I could use this, and then I learned how to drape, which was a nightmare. Um, and then I created, uh, because as, I don't know if, you, if, you've, if you've noticed, there's this, this um, shell that is 3D printed, because I needed a shell to make the draping, otherwise I couldn't make the draping my own, on, on my own. I had to have a support. So this is kind of a, um, my support. It's, it's all pierced, you'll see. And then I was draping using those, those things almost as a ruler. Um, and from there, then I evolved into all sorts of different kinds of draping that may exist. And that, I don't have the images, but that evolved into um, a series of tests of how 
the salt marsh could evolve, but the drawings are down, as you can see them. Yeah, those are the black drawings that are on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Um, we were talking at the very beginning of the representation of the human as a geologic force. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, and then after we were talking about um, this, the theory about scale and scale less, mm -hmm. do you think that would then influence the theory about scale less? Because as soon as we see a human as a, geolo uh, as a geologic force, that would influence how we measure ourselves yes uh, yes of course it will influence uh, the question now of course from a scientific point of view but also from a design point of view or even philosophical point of view is how can we measure ourselves because it's no longer about the body because it's what is becoming geologic is human agency we have changed um, our uh, atmospheric composition as the example of Colombia in the beginning is quite um, quite evident. We have changed the levels of um, acidification, the levels of radioactivity, um, we have changed geological disposition, so it's about how you humans become almost these supra-human agency, um, and how do we measure that? And that refutes basically in terms of when we bring that into the field of architecture. I don't know if you know this very influential um, modular that Le Corbusier developed during the modernism period, uh, where you have, um, which is not his invention, because um, Renaissance in Italy had the same model, which is usually the Vitruvius man, is usually a male body, um, that is used to measure everything. And even in the Bible, if you go back to the Bible, if we want to go, um, Adam was used as the measure of God, and uh, Eve was um, the, the, the second element measured against the first one, so there's always this thing about the male body, um, all the way up to very recently. Um, what I think is going to happen is that we need to abandon these standards, um, because these uh, canonical ways of understanding everything from the human body, or to compare everything against the human body, may be no longer the answer to all we do, because we are doing something far, um, far bigger and far more complex than just our human bodies. Yeah. Yes. I was just wondering, like, when you were saying you were looking at the human impacts on the landscape mm -hmm. with the um, that kind of time period, and you're saying about like peak time and that kind of thing. Um, did you look at all just out uh, of interest of like the future of Manhattan in terms of maybe like post population, sort of in terms of at the end of the Anthropocene or whenever humans kind of leave it? Um, you mean in terms of futurism? Just yeah, speculating. so I, I know in I think it's Detroit where urban decay and stuff, like loads of things that used to be fields are like coming back to fields mm -hmm. and they've had like. Um, Due to less human impact, they've had like herds of deer, and really like strange things happening, and then people have started to rework the land, and it's kind of almost gone sort of back in time. And areas that used to be fields and wild sort of meadows have actually started to return. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if like you looked into any of that, or that yeah. was an interest. Yeah, well, I'm constantly trying to look <coughs> for these more speculative ideas about what's going to happen to these cities. Detroit is a very specific example, it became a paradigmatic example actually, of what we now call the shrinking city. Um, and it was quite brutal what happened to Detroit, and it has to do with local industries yeah. failing and shutting down all of a sudden, people moving out, the city being completely devoided from life all of a sudden, and the, the land lost its value overnight, and so there's all sorts of um, problems there. And now they're testing new models for the city. In New York, the tendency is the opposite. So after a very calm period in the early 2000s, now uh, New York is experiencing yet another boom. Um, so in, and that boom was motivated to a certain extent with what happened in the 9-11. Uh, so they, they, they had this project to um, recover um, the, the Trade Center, and now with buildings around these voids. Um, and that has motivated to, and then the, the, um, Hurricane Katrina happened in 2014 and the city realized that they needed to become much more resilient. And from there, instead of going 
down the path of uh, resilience through many things that could be landscape-led. Yeah. And to a certain extent, there are a few projects testing that, but they also went to, let's build um, more solid skyscrapers, let's go deeper into the foundations, and that's, if you go now to New York, there's all sorts of things. For instance, Harlem is one of the, the worst examples of gentrification that I've ever seen because it's a very specific community made by Latins and Afro-Americans, Afro and they are just being pushed away because they want to build these skyscrapers. So the tendency, unfortunately, in New York is to keep doing what they have been doing over the last 200 years a bit longer. Let's see what happens. Yeah. No more questions? Okay, thank you very much, and I'll see you downstairs.